There's a concept I've been struggling with, especially in the past couple of weeks, when my my routine, my weekly, monthly schedule, uh, which I'm pretty religious about, it's not that it's too busy, but I feel like I'm at a crossroads where I need to start focusing on one of two paths in order to really get to the next level, in order to be able to afford myself the luxury, the convenience of staff or people that are going to help, you know, create a team, build a real production foundation of people that are going to be able to bring these projects and these incentives to the next level. It boils down to online versus local. And I've struggled with this. The first time that it became uh, a thing for me was during COVID when I realized like, wow, I can do so much from home uh, in the remote world of uh, being isolated in your own project studio. I learned a lot of things about how to have a presence online and how to build a brand. And mostly what I learned was what doesn't work. (laughs) But that's part of the game when you're an entrepreneur or a creative is to experiment, taste everything, try everything, see what fucks up, see what fails. And don't do that anymore. Do something that's a little bit more your style, your speed. And I'm finding the things that are working online, but it's not about being viral. It's about getting quality people around you in the online space. And that takes longer, in my mind, it takes longer because you're dealing with strangers around the world. And when all you gotta do is go out into your local environment, whether it's a bar, a venue, a stage, and you have an instant connection with people because it's local and because it's one-on-one, it's automatic and it can also be lifelong. So within a space of minutes, you can create a lifelong connection with a future lifelong fan, right? A very dedicated fan of the brand. That happens in five minutes in person where it can take months, even years of consistent bombardment of content online. So the quality is faster when it's in person than anything that you could possibly do online. And so I need the best of both worlds, but I feel like I need to focus. So the army of one, there's only so much that I can do. So to focus on the online exclusively so that I can really do it well and create like ludicrous amounts of content every single day, I could do that, but it'll take a hit on my ability to be the best possible version of the live in, in-person in version of me. So I won't have as much time for shows, events, and networking and all that kind of stuff. And if I go the other route and I concentrate on the quality connections, I will definitely not have time for as much online content. And so I'm trying to think what would be the best way to approach this in order to get to where I need to be to have the best of both of those worlds as soon as possible in the five-year plan. It seems to me that the local one-on-one, even though it brings less global notoriety in the short term, it creates and provides an opportunity to interact with and possibly find partners and team members that are really into the project, into the brand, that get what is this whole Tebow vision thing? Like, okay, I get it because I'm with you right now, Tebow, and I understand I'm asking you questions or we're talking about it and I get it, I see it. That doesn't exist online. That doesn't exist online in the short term. That decision to focus now on the local and the the live one-on-one, that's the focus, I think, in the short term so that the global reach of the brand, that's only ever going to happen in my mind with it a team. I need to be able to offload some of the responsibilities. And I wouldn't want to do it to just anyone that I hired on Fiverr or something like that. Like I'm realizing that I'm, I'm holding back from sharing those responsibilities or delegating because it's so important to me that it'd be the right people. And I've already met some incredible friends or rekindled friendships with people that I've met in the past and who have come back into my life as like, wow, listen, you know, we thought we were friends in the past. Now, you know, let's let's talk because there's some stuff in common. That whole creative vibe and having a, a midlife crisis or whatever it is that brings us back together. The conversations are so real and friendships are, you know, just so much more important to me now than they ever were in the past. New ones or rekindled older ones. And so I think that local, vibe of being able to focus on boots on the ground, events, networking, opportunities for mutual growth, allies, that kind of stuff really makes the foundation of the rest of the stuff, the online global stuff. To take a friend who I've done a gig with or done a project with and say, you know what, you're going to take care of the LinkedIn account. You're going to take care of the Instagram connection. You're going to be responsible for, like, I feel okay saying that with someone that I trust that we've worked together here locally to give them a piece of that responsibility for the, you know, the global international pie. Yeah, I guess I'm just talking to myself here. I'm saying it out loud so that I decide whether or not I believe it. I think I do. So local, short term, to get the global reach long term.
when things happen that seem pretty much impossible and yet they exist they happen they're real and you can't possibly refute the incredible power of manifestation or whatever you want to call it when it happens and you can't fucking deny it it is the most incredible sensation i am speechless amazed enthralled and just beside myself with the sheer <laughs> no idea how to explain it when it happens to you and you'll know that you're in the right place or you, that you were brought to the right place or that you were supposed to be in a certain place that feeling just magic it's pure magic so new project however slightly lying to you when i say it's a new project because the 3 a.m song by the brook already exists i wrote it uh a couple years ago three years ago i want to say it seems like that i can actually find out i know the answer to this november 2020 and i passed a copy of it an early copy of it over to my man uh, uncle fubar enzo lucia he and i immediately sort of bonded over this like oh my god this this is a song this is a freaking song it is something that is a milestone achievement for me as a songwriter because back in 2020 i feel like for the first time I was willing to expand outside of like the confines of normal songwriting. I think the best way I could describe the executive summary of my songwriting journey, and I think this is similar for many, many songwriters, not that it matters, but I, I find this in common with many people that I've spoken to that are just getting to know the, the kind of songwriter that they are. In the very early stages, we can't help but emulate people that we admire. So for instance, myself, I've always admired the Eagles and the Doobie Brothers and vocal classic rock groups, Blue Rodeo, that have incredible harmonies in the vocals, but also really nice, tasty, not over the top, but just tasty classic rock guitar rhythms and riffs and hooks with very cool classic rock style uh, acoustic drum kit beats, you know, anything from Led Zeppelin to Blue Rodeo and in between, that kind of a style. And I've always admired that. And so as a songwriter, I tend to, I've tend i tended to gravitate towards that. But interesting stuff was happening when I was writing songs. There were elements of jazz, which definitely comes from my dad, and listening to groups like Manhattan Transfer and the Double Six. Uh, René Thomas was a, one of my dad's favorite guitarists growing up. So I got this infusion of just horn players and jazz guitarists and weirdo kind of sounds coming out of the basement when he was practicing guitar. And so that has crept into my music over the years. It was inevitable. And some other influences that I didn't realize were there, some reggae, punk, ska kind of vibes every once in a while, which I haven't really infused into much of my music lately, but it's going to be there, I think, in, uh, before the end of the 24 Song Project is done. And so this song, By the Brook, it doesn't match any of those. And that's when I realized, I'm like, wow, I'm finally trying to branch out. And not for the sake of being different, but just because I had an idea and I knew I wasn't doing it justice by adhering to the same old-fashioned songwriting techniques. Let's copy, you know, the Eagles or let's copy these bands that I love so much. And so it really became an experiment in songwriting. And I was trying to describe to Enzo, which I will try and do for you here, okay? Because this is a song about a dream. So the drummer... The main drummer, you're going to hear him, he's just playing simple stuff. But there's this ghost drummer. And the ghost drummer, you don't hear the actual hits of the drums. All you hear is the reverb wash. And he was kind of like, what are you smoking? Like, what have you been, you've been day drinking? Like, what's wrong with you, man? This doesn't make any sense. And I was vehement about it. I'm like, no, 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 I can hear it. I can hear it. It's the fucking clear as day. It's just, I know exactly what to do. And I said, I might even put in a ghost choir. And he's like, what are you talking about? Ghost choir? Anyway, when I finally got him a pre-production version of the track, he immediately clicked in. He immediately clicked in and said, wow, I get this. I think this is my favorite song of yours, Tebow. And I'm like, yeah, that's amazing. What a huge compliment from a fellow songwriter that I respect so much. Enzo is just a fountain of ideas and an incredible resource for like the history of rock and the history of music and all kinds of things related to riffs and chords. And for him to have said that to me was like, wow, I know I'm onto something. So I felt like for the first time I was breaking out of my box in 2020, the end of 2020. And many things have happened since then. So it was the beginning of a domino effect, I think, for a lot of other things. But this song now, coming back to it, and it was never released. I only had the pre-production that I shared with a couple of people, Enzo included. And I thought to myself, should I release it? Because it's such a weird song. And the answer was, especially now, is a resounding yes. Not only do I want to release it, I 
have to release it. It has to be done. And so I'm making notes. I'm taking uh, I'm taking the original structure of the song and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with it in order to be able to get the most out of this. Now, I have in my arsenal Mr. Ramco on the violin and Mr. Henry Cobb on the Fender Rhodes, Mr. Antoine Toussignon on the lead guitar and just like an embarrassing amount of breath of direction to go. And so today in my task schedule, I have uh, on my daunting things to do is to figure out the structure of this song, you know, and I'm kind of like, what is the word I'm thinking of? I'm feeling like this is some really unexpected pressure. I want so much for this to remain one of my favorite songs, and I don't want to make it worse than that original pre-production. Now, I know in my heart it won't be worse, but I also know that it's going to be different. And there's something to be said about people who record just for fun. And sometimes there's something in the air, there's something in the water, and it just comes out perfectly. And it's almost impossible to recreate. And so that's the feeling. I put this song on a very high pedestal for so long, thinking I could never do this. Even, I, I mean, I did a lead guitar track, which is strange for me because I'm not a lead guitarist. And to have done that lead guitar and sort of almost nailed what I thought was in my head, I'm like, wow, I don't think I could ever do this again. It just came out right that day. And so I'm going to try my best in the next couple of weeks to do this song justice, to give it the, the credo that it deserves in order to release this 3 a.m., which is a complete shift away from now because we had Pretty Shannon, which starts with a Celtic rock, da -da 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 -da, right? It's very understandable. It's very easy to relate to. The 2 a.m. is very much a more of a gritty rocking, rock and roll song, classic rock, more guitar laden. And it sort of brings us to the point in the 24 hour clock where like we're drunk and we're done. The 3 a.m. song now is the guy passes out. The protagonist in this whole story is asleep. And so it's the very first instance where we get into this dream world and we're like, what? What is this? It doesn't make any sense. And that's the point. It's not supposed to be conventional. And this is where I will lose fans. <laughs> this is where I'm going to lose fans. I'm going to say, this is too weird for me. But if you're willing to take the journey to get past the uncomfortable part of the dream, which albeit is pretty intense, you might hate it, you might love it. I'm hoping that it will be the latter and that you will be willing to see the journey through. So having said that, now I have to commit to a structure of the song. I already got some ideas. The original song is very short, and it's just a four chord progression throughout. And I never really wanted to put a bridge into it because I kind of liked the, I'm gonna, I was gonna call it monotony, but I, I like the stability of the four chords throughout and changing exclusively the instrumentation. The only thing that does change, and it changes so drastically, it starts with an acoustic guitar with a hi-hat, the regular drummer, if you will. It builds to add various elements, it crescendos with this epic, all-out, balls-to-the-ground freaking lead guitar, electric lead guitar, very classic rock style. And as soon as that solo is done, it everything wanes and returns back to the acoustic with the hi-hat. Like, the dream is done. And so are the instrumentations that go along with it. And so there's really not much to it. There's only three verses. Now what I've kind of decided earlier is that I wanted to have that same acoustic and hi-hat build at the start and at the end. And now including a second new verse. A second new verse that is sort of like a modified version of what I had here in order to be able to allow a second opportunity for building or a third opportunity for building. And I have to basically create some lyrics. So I think I'm going to sit down on the couch with the acoustic and build a, a second version of this verse. I'm stalling. I'm so stalling right now. I need to be able to build this. I got to do this today. I might take off the Garmin and ignore any calls for a last minute sub if I get it so that I can dip into the scotch and allow my own brain to wander into a small sort of a fuzzy dream state of its own and allow the song to really ferment and almost crystallize. So exciting. When I started uh, talking to uh, my buddy Jim, the owner of Cunningham's Pub in St. Anne de Bellevue, after like a 15 year hiatus almost of not being involved in music in any way. And we reconnected immediately uh, and it was just it's like old friends back together. Like, yeah, oh my God, go, come on. We got to get you gigging here, man. Let's come to, let's get Tebow at the pub. And um, he, he invited me to restart up the jam night that I had done so many years back. And I was like, oh yeah, that'd be a blast. Let's do it. And he says, what's the format? How do you want to do it? So, well, I'll do it alone. I'll do it solo. 
and um, so I can get more money. <laughs> and I, but I kind of want to be able to encourage songwriters to do their originals. It's like a safe place. It's a safe space for anyone to come and play a cover, you know, their first time on guitar. They've never sang before. I mean, whatever they want. And on more than one occasion, on multiple occasions, we've had the most delightful experiences with first time songwriters playing their original. It's never seen the light of day and they play it on the tiny little stage at the local pub. And it's just beautiful. It's like, I mean, it's like, you know, start crying. It's so damn emotional. And so what we've done is we've decided how can we reward these, these people? So Jim came up with the idea a long time ago. We're finally instigating. He says, let's give anyone that comes up on stage, goes in a draw and it gets a chance to win like a $50 gift certificate. I'm like, that's great. Thank you, Jim. He's very generous with that. He wants to offer some kind of a thank you so that's what we're going to do i'm going to the pub now and i'm going to solicit i think it's dom dom is working today she doesn't know it yet <laughs> she's gonna be on camera drawing the winner which have all the names in a pot all of the august jammers and we're gonna do the same thing every month so how fun is that all you gotta do is go up on stage and you can win freaking money isn't that the way it's supposed to be come on Let's go! The $50 gift certificate for the August Jammers. You know how fun the jam nights are. Jam nights are a blast. Bob, I'm going to trust you to pick the winner for the August draw. Put my hand into there and pick it in. So, with a little bit of scotch to uh, help infuse the, uh, the creative processes for this dreamscape of a song, it needs to be surreal, but it needs to come from a normal place. So, 1 a.m. song, Celtic rock. 2 a.m. song, drunken rock. 3 a.m. song, passed out, <laughs> he's out. So he's coming from a normal place and quickly being transformed and transported into the dream world. And so the song goes with that acoustic guitar, familiar acoustic guitar and very simple hi-hat, which leads into the addition of the violin and the Rhodes and the hi-hat and the acoustic guitar. So just a very simple, it's like it's getting, oh, it's getting weird, but it's still in the realm of normal. And verse one, I had messed around uh, and I recruited the help of AI to start messing around with the existing lyrics to say, take this existing lyric uh, for the song and transform it into the old English style of the Tolkien realm. And I'm like, all right, I got Tolkien on the brain today. And it was just too much. It was way too much. You know, hark now, uh, where dost thou? And I was like, nah. And I tried a more psychedelic direction and it was also kind of like disrespectful to the theme of the song. It was like, yeah, you know, too <laughs> weird. I don't know. It was just too cavalier. So I thought, what would be a good idea? I wanted to add the extra verse. I knew I needed a new verse too. So I thought, I'm going to stick with the original. Hey there, where you going? It's very like plain English. And it's kind of repeating the same thing that I'm saying in verse one, but with a little bit of the older English style. Hark now, weary wanderer, ease your burdensome woe. Hither be, windborne effortlessly. Go on from here and then that's where it gets into the it starts to get weird and this is where the ghost drummer and the ghost choir start coming from here from where where am i well that's the whole point we don't know where he is no one can know where the dreamscape exists right over the mountain through the trees sure where you'll find the most gentle breeze in verse four here comes the ghost drummer and this is when he sees her he locks eyes with this beautiful sylvan vixen sort of a nymph on the edge of the river of the brook, reading a book, lazy lines with perfect eyes and no crying and the killer solo. And when it comes out of that, the mist settles and the dream is dissipating. And we're going back to the very same lyric at the start, which is in plain English. And it's coming back to normal, but it's about to get fucking weird. After the 3M song, it doesn't get normal. It's just like landing back on the normal flagstone, the stepping stone of what's next, because that's where the dream started, and it's also where the dream ends, but the direction is still unknown. I think these are the lyrics. It's so hard to commit, and I texted Enzo, I can't read it because I'm recording on the phone, but he said, oh, dude, I, I, I texted him, I said, I'm feeling super nostalgic, Fubar. I'm digging back in to buy the brook. It's the 3M song it's coming next it's gonna finally see the world it's gonna be out there and he goes oh wow be careful with this one take your time <laughs> he's like he remembers we both remember how meaningful this was to us this song i know it's just a bunch of lyrics now and in this part of the vlog no one's like what the hell is he talking about but you'll see you will see by the brook let it just take you over i love going to the butcher i love going to the market
<laughs> we never script when we go to the butcher just because the guys are amazing. Thank you so much for being amazing. That's the stuff. I ran out of time. I couldn't get to Cardinal Brewing. Oh, look who's here. Hi. Fantastic. What a boon. Thanks for the recommend, bro. I'm happy to. My Appreciate name's it. Will. Come see me in Hudson anytime. Always, always. Love you guys. So if we burn out tonight, Neil Young got that right. He said it's better than fading away. Uh, I've talked about this already, how uh, FUBAR, uh, we vibed on it pretty hard. And uh, just, it gave me a lot of inspiration, a lot of motivation. He helped me feel so confident about exploring a really kind of a fucked up idea. Like, it doesn't make any sense, but that's some of the best creative stuff. It is important because it doesn't fit, and it's sort of breaking ground. And so that's what I want to try and do. It was my first kind of a flex in that regard with this song. So the original pre-production which was never released it had this notion of being the 3 a.m. song is a dream I want to have it sort of start based in reality go into a really weird place and then come back so I created two drum tracks in my mind one is a simple one that just has hi-hat kick and snare and that's sort of like the the conservative regular steeped in reality anchor of the song is the regular drummer and the ghost drummer that I wanted to have in this song was going crazy and trying so hard to be heard but you never hear anything except the reverb wash of his playing so I thought why not do that with everything <laughs> like why not and so I'm sort of retooling the lyrics I've extended the song a little bit verse 2 which never existed until now it's kind of like a an old English rendition of verse 1 so verse 1 hey there where you going don't you worry don't you fret so hark now where we wander ease your burdensome woe hither be wind born effortlessly go on without a care and it starts and ends pretty much with the same notion go on without a care from here. And in the first iteration of it, where it's still kind of steep in normalcy, not so much ghost stuff happening, not so much dreamscape happening yet, verse 1 ends from here. Where is here? And that's a thing. It's a question mark. We don't know where here is. We haven't made it into the dream yet. So that's why I introduced a refrain. Something that basically introduces a whole bunch of ghost stuff. So we're building this song here. On that note, we're going to say intro 1 is one chord progression with just the hi-hat and Henry on on the roads a ghost version of that sort of like there's one reality and one ghost and then as we grow the instrumental version of this is a second iteration of the chord progression where we hear the same thing basic normal hi-hat the ghost roads and then the ghost choir I'm going to get Annie involved in this. She's already agreed to do it. Uh, hopefully, Ram will be willing to do some vocals. I'm sure she will. I don't know why she wouldn't. And I'll invite anyone else in the gang that wants to be a part of the ghost choir <laughs> in, the, in the Visionaries to do so. So it'll be fun to have a little ghost choir. Like, there's the spirits that are appearing. And then a third, yet a third iteration of that chord progression to introduce the ghost violin. And I, at first, wasn't sure how Ram was going to feature in this song. She's going to be the most prominent of the ghost ghostly voices and when she appears in the third intro refrain chord progression it's gonna be like whew, that's where the emotions sort of kick in like where are we what is this and then for the first time verse one happens after all of this you know instrumental introduction of the songs like just something normal weird weird and then when we hear the voice when i when i hit that first vocal it's as if the ghosts scattered like what the fuck Whoop, something what's going on hey there where you going don't you worry, don't you fret. The ghosts disappear. And you just hear an acoustic guitar straight up with the hi-hat and just the bass comes in. So like the bass is what's scaring them away. Boom. So the only three instruments that exist in the real world version of this song, they appear for verse one. And then there's a refrain after that first normal verse and the ghosts come back. The ghost roads, the ghost choir, and the ghost violin are sort of going to build into that refrain. And then when verse two comes, it's a little bit like the same thing that happened in verse one. The ghosts disappear and we hear now the acoustic guitar, the bass, and a kick drum. So it's sort of like also something new to scare away the ghosts. And we hear the verse being sung with the sort of old English style lyrics. Hark now, blah, blah, blah. Go on without a care from here. And then when we say from here, when I actually say those words, that's when the ghosts sort of say, okay, we're all gonna be together in this story. And then the, the ghost 
violin and the ghost roads and the ghost choir come in far from here over the mountain through the trees welcome to dreamland you know everyone's together the verse four is like a big version of this there's one more ghost that comes into play that's the ghost drummer and so when the ghost drummer comes in we see the lady by the brook and she is waiting there Think Bon, uh, John Bon, John Bonham, John Bonzo. I almost call him John Bonham on the kit. The ghost of like a really heavy classic rock drummer comes into play and by the brook, reading lazy lines. The choir, everyone working together, and then the only real world instrument that is left is the electric solo, electric solo guitar. And I haven't figured out how to work this. This is not clear in my head yet. And I think I'm going to need to get some of the tracks recorded in order to be able to understand how to make this solo as fucking powerful as possible. The lead guitar that I did is kind of reminiscent of this style that I want, but the talent wasn't there. And so I'm wondering if it's going to be Antoine, if it's going to be, I don't know what's best yet to go for pure raw talent or to go with like what I really feel is right for it. So I haven't decided that yet. I'm going to talk with Antoine about it and see what he thinks. So that's sort of like a little question mark. And then the outro, once the solo, the epic solo is done, that's when we get into the outro and all the ghosts, they're not scared away anymore. They just, they've done their bit. They've told the story and they just dissipate into the air. And all that's going to be left is the acoustic and the hi-hat. The kick drum that scares the ghost is gone. The bass that scares the ghosts is gone. And there's just that acoustic, but it's more than what was at the intro. The very beginning, if you remember, was the hi-hat and the ghost roads. So now the ghost roads is being replaced with the acoustic and the hi-hat. And then we just fit from here. That's the design. Now we must build it. I'm emotional and excited. It's fucking, it's like, it's so fun. Not sure. So at that section there, we're gonna stop the click. Because I don't feel comfortable having it be a click anywhere at the end of that. Kind of need that to be the way it goes. Design wise, I think that's the way it needs to go. Lose all structure. Lose all structure. And then faster, yeah, heart racing. I just don't know if this is a reliable guide track now. So how fast did I go? Much faster. And then I slowed it down, that's good. But it's still faster. It hesitates, it wanders. I love it. So this is the right tempo. I'm going to go with this. This is whatever I could produce here. And it's not that I can't get it perfect, but to fuck around with it doesn't make any sense. It is what it is. Oh my goodness. I have committed to a guide track for By the Brook. I'm not going to do ghost drums and regular drums today. So let's say for all intents and purposes, it's one, two, three, four. Just the fucking sound check and volumes and practicing is two hours. So I, I don't want to be rushed. Fuck no, I don't want to be rushed. On this, I want a whole day. That's where I should have fucking committed to the... Anyway, whatever. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. I had a day put aside during the week that uh, also was after so many shows. I'm making excuses now. I was exhausted on the day I was supposed to record the drums. And so I pushed it off saying, ah, I'll do it on the Saturday. So this is the work that I would have done last time. And I would have been here. And I would have been setting up the drums at 11 o'clock. So I need to reschedule the drum recording. <sighs> For a time that I don't have a gig. So next week is good because, oh my god, next week is fucking amazing. Because I don't have many gigs. Just having the foundation of the of the guide track alone is so important. I don't know why I was worried about committing to the design of it. I felt comfortable enough because I had the time to design properly to add in this little bridge. It's the, it's the Lady of the Brook turning the last page right there. Something's amiss because it's time for the ghosts to leave. 
and it's faster. Everyone's like, what, 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 what? Leaving. And then it's the protagonist saying, hey there, where are you going? So how do we modify the last verse? Hey there, where are you going? He's talking to the ghosts. He's saying goodbye to the ghosts. He's wondering where they're going. Something that connects, something that holds you. There's your burden. And the ghosts say something. Ghost hushes. <laughs> free fly. That kind of shit. This has been a journey of lyrical discovery. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing for Oktoberfest? What are these called? Little picorettes. Picorettes. We uh, splurged, and uh, we're gonna put some pretty expensive stuff on top of those. A little caviar. Yeah. It's so good. I know it's so good. Oktoberfest.